So we are in the midst of a four-part uh, event tonight. We just did our first part, and some of you that are uh, watching the, the podcast, or I will listen to the podcast last week are noticing that it went a little longer than my 30-minute allotment. And uh, so I'm, I don't know if I should apologize because I, I did the same thing with episode one. It was a little longer. I think I just have to get warmed up. Now I'm warmed up, but I always feel sort of obligated to give backstory. You know, it's like, okay, we haven't talked for a month. So some of you just finished listening to the fourth one. You didn't need any of that. So I will just try and move us forward today. But we're, we're dealing with life and leadership lessons from Teddy Roosevelt. And this is episode six. And uh, a critical juncture in uh, Teddy's life. All of these that I'm giving are, are sort of unique moments uh, of how he is going to respond and you're going to see a man that is going to become legendary. That in, but it's because he's like ready to step into those crowded hour moments. And so this is part six, McKinley's Down. Uh, I actually had a sermon uh, that was called The Gentle President, and it's about the assassination of William McKinley. Very powerful message. And I, most people don't know anything about William McKinley. Uh, and he's not even ranked very high in history as far as presidents. I tend to really like him. And I, I'm a big McKinley fan. Uh, and more in how he lived and died. I mean, how he's going to die is one of the most extraordinary stories uh, that I've ever heard. So that's a separate one. I'm not going into that today. McKinley's down. And that plays into Teddy's life. So I have a term that I use in my leadership. We use it here at Ellerslie a lot, uh, you know, because when you're in an environment like Ellerslie, you sort of create your own dialect, your own language to articulate things. You just say the word and everyone knows what you mean. And being presidential is a term that it means a lot in our world. It means take your responsibility, step in and do what you're supposed to do. And if you do, you do know that the Holy Spirit's going to back you. And to be presidential means to do the hard thing when you really don't want to, okay? It's, it's a crowded hour thing, just like we talked about in the last episode, where there are these key moments in your life and you're built for them. You're designed for them. God has set you up and led you to this exact moment. And then he shines a spotlight on that piece of ground that he wants you to walk into. And that's being presidential. If you're the leader, you're the one that's supposed to walk out there. Yeah, but I could get shot if I walk out there. Yeah, this horrible thing can happen. Believe me, I've had these thoughts so many times. Because in my role with Ellerslie, in my role in my marriage, in my role in my family, in my role in the church, I am the guy that inevitably has to do this hard thing. Now, every now and then I can, you know, get Nathan to, you know, do some of that. And is it like, isn't that your job description? You're supposed to do that thing. But a lot of these moments, like that hard conversation, Eric needs to make the call. Eric needs to, you know, I'm looking around the room saying, is someone, can someone else do this? Why do I need to do it? Well, it's because it's my responsibility. And so being presidential means to step up and boldly do, courageously do what you know you are anointed to do. Now, if you were to take that into your individual life, you need to recognize that if you were to be quote unquote presidential and just do what you know to do, you can expect to have God's grace back you up. I've had so many moments where I've had to do a very, very hard thing. And yet as I do it willingly and I step into that, I get grace. And we've sort of learned that as leaders here, there are these moments where it's time for you to say something. Eric hands you the, the mic and it's your turn to say something. If you lean on the spirit of God instead of your own understanding, I tell you what, you will discover very quickly that God will work in and through you. And this is just the principle of what I call being presidential or stepping into your crowded hour. Wearing the sweater vest, the art of composed leadership. So we sort of have a joking understanding in America that when there's a world crisis, when there's a huge event in America, the president needs to get on national television, right? And so the way that he'll do it is he'll put on not the suit and tie version, but either the open collar or the sweater vest. And so the sweater vest in American understanding is sort of the way of the president showing that he's not concerned, Okay, because if he was concerned, he put on a tie, right? But he's not concerned, so his collar's open. He's not concerned, so he has a sweater vest on. He seems relaxed, and it's very purposeful. 
You see, I know I can't, I don't want to speak for modern presidencies because we've sort of altered all of our equilibrium is just off uh, right now. But historic understanding of it is the president is responsible to convey order, to convey that nothing is wrong, to bring peace because no one is going to make a good decision through anxiety, through the lens of panic. So if we're going to work through this together as a nation, we need to be calm. So I'm just calling wearing the sweater vest, the art of composed leadership. So I believe it or not, I actually think about these things a lot, that my attitude and my approach, even in how you are perceiving it, actually matters to me as a leader. In other words, that I want you guys to recognize I am not shaken by what's going on in this world. Oh, I know how dark it is but I am not going to lose my head over it. And I am going to have confidence in my God. That's called wearing a sweater vest as a leader because it's not gonna do you any good if I start panicking in front of you saying, it's all lost. And you're gonna think, uh, wait, that's not your job, Eric. Your job is to actually minister peace and to, ex- to espouse faith, right? You're right. You're on to something there. Even as a father in a home, there is a responsibility of bombs are dropping outside that the children always look at the face of the father and they want to see if this is dangerous or not. And if the father is laughing, smiling at, at ease, they are. But if the father is panicky, guess what? That, that panic immediately transfers to the kids. The trials of Winston Churchill. Now this will get to Teddy, right? But I have to go through some of my favorite moments in history first, you know, because this is an opportunity for me to bring in stories I don't usually get a chance to talk about. So in World War II, I I mean, someone asked me the other day, what was your favorite? It was sort of caught me off guard. What was your favorite thing about World War II? It's like I did 93 episodes on World War II. So my brain is trying to go through this large catalog. And I felt like my answer was pathetic compared to, if you give me some time to think that through, there were so many things, and I'd say my favorite thing in World War II, with now some time to ponder, is Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill's leadership. That, it's simply, you know, for me, that is like Teddy Roosevelt's response to his crowded hour. It, it has that type of impact upon me, because that's exactly what Winston is doing. Talk about a crowded hour. May of 1940, when he is given the prime ministership of England in its darkest hour. This is the craziest thing. And he says that he steps into it and slept like a baby that night because finally he can do something about the problems in the world as opposed to complain about it. It's like, well, that's a good way of looking at it, I guess. But do you do, you do know, Winston, that the weight of the world is on your shoulders now. By the way, do you guys do know that my middle name is Winston, don't you? So... After this, in 1940, we're going to have the Battle of Britain, and it's, you know, London's going to be bombed by the Luftwaffe, which is the Air Force for the Germans. Terrible uh, stretch of time. And Churchill is going to be wearing the sweater vest the whole time. I mean, it is a profound picture. He is unruffled. He gives speeches that are going to give the, the nation hope, and they're going to rise up, and they're going to change the nation just under his leadership. But after all the noise settles and the, the, the war sort of begins to turn in Britain's favor and America is now in and every, everything is starting to look bright, uh, even though we're still in the middle of World War II. Well, the nation, now that they don't feel a threat, start to find all sorts of flaw in their leaders. By the way, this is a very familiar thing as well. In a time of difficulty, people appreciate leaders. In a time of ease, leaders are, you know, just sitting there to receive pot shots. And that is a very, very common thing, which is why a leader has to understand these dynamics. So there is a vote of confidence that is called in Parliament January 1942, which is the way of saying, uh, do we really want this guy as our leader anymore? We need to discuss this. It's like that is the ultimate spittle in the face to a leader who just carried his nation through the hardest moment maybe in their history. And now it's like, do we really want this guy anymore? Thank you, Winston, for all your hard work. So here's what Winston Churchill said. This is January of 1942. This is after 20 months of hellish battle, nearly dying of a heart attack a week earlier and almost shot down on his return plane flight home from the United States. So it's not that things have been going easy for this guy. And this is when they call for the vote of confidence. He says, everyone could see with intense relief that our life as a nation and empire was no longer at stake. 
On the other hand, the fact that the sense of mortal danger was largely removed set every critic, friendly or malevolent, free to point out the many errors which had been made. Winston Churchill continues. He says, I remember that wise French saying. By the way, guys, I am, in, in, in the past, I've tried to actually say these things. I am not going to do that now because then people come back at me and make comments, okay? So because of all those comments, I'm going to skip the French here. I'm just going to give the translation. But it's a French saying. One can govern hearts only by keeping one's composure. Isn't that just an interesting statement? One can govern hearts only by keeping one's composure. So I'm going to give you a translation from French to British to American. So the French say it that way. You can see it on the screen. If you're only getting this via podcast, just imagine a whole bunch of French. And the British translates to one can govern hearts only by keeping one's composure. Now we're going to translate it into American. When faced with public stir, go into your spiritual closet and grab that ever faithful sweater vest. This is how you lead in a time of difficulty. Now, translation for us as believers, sweater vest. It's called grace. We have access to something in a time of crisis that if we go into our closet, it is always there and it's waiting to be put on. And so as leaders, as influencers in this world, when we, in that crisis moment, go to God to that heavenly armory and stick on that sweater vest, that composure, that peace, that calm, that faith, that confidence that our God is in control, all right? It may look like the world has fallen to pieces. Yes, we have an invasion on our shores. Yeah, they're coming straight for us. However, our God still sits on the throne, people. He is not fretting. He is not foreboding. He is not fearful right now. So I see no reason for me to go in that direction. That is putting on your sweater vest as a leader for your marriage, for your family, for your church, for your business, for the body of Christ as a whole, for the lost and dying world. One of the greatest influences you can have is in a time of social crisis for you to step forward with your sweater vest on. Everyone else is losing their head and you're completely calm with a smile on your face. And everyone says, what do you know that I don't know? I'd love to answer that. Thank you for asking. So it looks like it says the job dilemma, but I put a, uh, a little marker over that O to make it strong, right? So it's the Job dilemma. He's a character in the Bible, right? So the Job dilemma, when you're at your lowest, CNN shows up with a camera crew. Don't you ever think about that with Job? The poor guy has lived this whole life up to that point, which was supposedly an extraordinary life, and God's bragging about it, right? But we don't get to look at that life. We get it right when everything starts to fall apart, right? And Satan like brings his crews in, and he's like, let's capture this, right? In other words, it's all going south. And For a leader, it's very common that when things are difficult, everyone comes in to nitpick. When things are going well, You know, you don't get the same type of response. And so CNN shows up with its camera crew. Job's friends show up. You guys ever heard of these guys? It's so easy to give criticism when someone is in a weakened, vulnerable state. I, you know, I I have a lot of experience in this. I've had moments where you would think that I had some disease upon me. And everyone that usually likes to linger near me sort of is, you know, I, you know, the equivalent of having COVID. You know, everyone's like doing their distancing from me, you know, wearing their masks around me because, you know, obviously there's some curse upon me. I, I remember even when we were walking through some of our financial challenges at Ellerslie, it was really weird how many people came up to me and started telling me what we were doing wrong at Ellerslie and how we shouldn't be having these. It's sort of like if you were truly walking in the grace of God, you wouldn't have these challenges right now. And what I want to say is, guys, that's not a biblical concept. I don't know who came up with that. The fact that I'm having challenges could be the direct statement to everyone that maybe I am walking in agreement with the living God. Completely different framework, but a leader has to absorb this. This is not easy because when you're in your difficult moment is when you want the most support, and it's oftentimes when you have the least. Isaiah 30, 15. This is a sweater vest scripture, guys. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. You see, in these moments, when you go to your closet, 
and you find that sweater vest of grace and you put it on, you say, Lord, I have you. I may not have public approval ratings right now and I have a lot of people that are questioning every single thing I do, but guess what? I'm gonna rest in the fact that I have your favor. That I'm walking in a clear conscience right now before you. And that that's what matters most to me right now. The trials of Hudson Taylor. The struggling missionary, he was out of money in desperate straits. I don't know why that's so encouraging to me. Uh, to know that Hudson Taylor, I mean, I named my first son, you know, after uh, Hudson. So it's obviously a rather impacting character in my life. And I don't know why it feels good to know that Hudson Taylor had financial challenges. It's like, it, it sounds sort of mean, doesn't it? You know, misery loves his company. And yet, it's not that he had the challenges, it's that God always rescued him out of them. I mean, profound stories that come out of this man's life. But the feedback he's going to get in this very challenging moment, this is the beginnings of his ministry, and there's all these British businessmen back home that look at having financial challenges being out of the favor of God, as opposed to recognizing that no challenge comes with those that walk in the favor of God. I mean, you could just start with Job. It's like the guy wasn't doing something wrong. That was where Job's friends went off. They missed it. You see, it wasn't because he was doing something wrong. It was because, ironically, he was doing something right. So the response of the British businessmen, if you were better with your resources, Sonny, then you wouldn't be in such circumstances. You know that there's another man on earth at this exact time that is going to hear of Hudson Taylor's situation and he's going to respond to him. It's someone I'd like to think like you and me. Someone that understands the challenges and the rigors of carrying a cross in this world. Someone who understands that when you step up for Jesus, you're going to get hit. And when you've gone through it, you're more inclined to hand out sweater vests of your own. It's like, hey, you might want to put this on. George Mueller, of all people, it's weird to think of George Mueller and Hudson Taylor having a correspondence. But George Mueller is going to hear about what is going on with Hudson Taylor, and the seasoned front lines veteran is going to send him an encouraging note and a little something extra. The British businessmen don't send him any money. Guess who sends him money in his darkest hour? George Mueller, the man who is also living by faith. That's a remarkable story, and I think what I want you guys to catch in this is whether you are Hudson Taylor right now, that God works in a beautiful way in and through his body to encourage us in just the right way. But many of us, we need to be the George Mueller in this story. And we need to remember that for to be a great leader oftentimes means understanding the rigors of leadership and to support others in their steps of obedience. The response of Franklin D. Roosevelt. So this is in the 19, January 1942. And Franklin Roosevelt knows a little something about public opinion polls and how challenging it can be. And so he actually is going to send a telegram to Winston Churchill when he hears that they are calling for a vote of confidence. And so this is what it said. It's cabled to Churchill in January of 1942. It is fun to be in the same decade with you. You know, it's little moments like this that go a long way. So the Mueller FDR infusion of strength, God always supplies what we need to keep going. I don't know how to describe it, guys, but when you're at your darkest moment, even if everyone abandons you, there is this Mueller FDR infusion. If you wait on your God, he will always give you the courage and the strength to keep going. Second Corinthians 12, nine. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, says Paul, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's sweater vest terminology right there. You see, in that weakened state, God gives you that calm and confidence. He gives you everything you need so that you can actually smile at the difficulties instead of fall apart under them. So... Here we are back in this critical time period, the end of the century. McKinley is president. He's going to be president for two terms. In his first term, his VP 
is Garrett Hobart. And Garrett Hobart's going to get sick, and he's a stout character uh, of his own right. And uh, it's going to be very clear, nothing to worry about. You know, everything is totally fine. Uh, Mark Hanna, who's the top advisor of President William McKinley, is going to say nothing but death or an earthquake can stop the renomination of Vice President Hobart. Now, I'm setting you up. This is all foreshadow. Because Hobart is going to die. It's going to leave a vacancy in the vice presidency. And it's right as McKinley is heading into uh, his next season as president. So he's being reelected, but he doesn't have a VP. The unlikely vice president. So the surprising event that's going to lead to this is the death of Garrett Hobart, November 21st, 1899. Theodore Roosevelt is going to become the vice president of the United States in March of 1901. He would serve in that role for only six months. So because of this vacancy, because of this huge loss in America, but also because Roosevelt is going to step into his crowded hour on July 1st, 1990, what was 1898, when he is going to step into that, he is going to become a public figure. Everyone knows the name Theodore Roosevelt, and he's going to embody something, something that this nation is craving. They want whatever that guy has. And so McKinley is going to bring him on to the ticket. He's going to become the VP. So, I mean, if you think about all of these dynamics, it's, it's because Theodore Roosevelt steps into that crowded hour that he's even in this situation in the first place. So in and through this tragedy, in and through this weakness in the United States, in comes Theodore Roosevelt. And then McKinley, after he's reelected, is going to be assassinated. And this is six months into his second term as president. And guess who's the VP? Theodore Roosevelt. That's how Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. The unlikely president and the surprising event is the assassination of President William McKinley, September 14th, 1901. So I'm going to give you just a little insight into Theodore Roosevelt right here, because everything I'm talking about as far as wearing a sweater vest, it's hard to just enunciate in one story with him because he laughed at danger. He did. I mean, every story shows that, but it's hard to just get one story where it's like he, he, has a tra- he has a tragedy in the nation. He's going to put his sweater vest on and step in front of the nation. That's not really how it's going to work, which is why I'm sort of going in from a different angle to try and enunciate something about him. Colonel Teddy Roosevelt standing before his troops. Okay, remember, this is crowded hour moment, guys. And this is what he is going to say to the men that follow him. He is in a moment that would cause most men to melt He's in a situation that he is desiring to step into instead of cowering from. And he's going to commission every one of those Rough Riders to do the same. This is a great speech, guys. Listen to this. Gentlemen, you have now reached the last point. If any one of you doesn't mean business, let him say so now. An hour from now will be too late to back out. Once in, you've got to see it through. You've got to perform without flinching whatever duty is assigned you, regardless of the difficulty or the danger attending it. If it is garrison duty, you must attend to it. If it is meeting fever, you must be willing. If it is the closest kind of fighting, anxious for it. You must know how to ride, how to shoot, how to live in the open. Absolute obedience to every command is your first lesson. No matter what comes, you mustn't squeal. I like that line. Think it over, all of you. If any man wishes to withdraw, he will be gladly excused, for others are ready to take his place. Whew. Okay, now that is an incredible enunciation of the man right there. This is how he lived, and this is how he called his nation to live. There is a reason why he's considered by many to be the most beloved president. He didn't live in times of war, which is usually what makes a beloved president. He didn't live in, live in times of a depression, which is another reason that people love a president or hate a president, is because they feel like he personally helped them out of a challenge. He didn't have any of that. And yet he's possibly, arguably, the most beloved president. The sweater vest. Check your closet. It's there. Just waiting to bring you a bit of calm amidst the storm. So I'm going to call it the grace gap. When you come into a situation, let's call it your crowded hour, your challenge, and here you are in the human side. You're lacking something. What is that something? It's the something that is needed to get you from here into that moment. 
When you come to that, you, there's a gap. There's a missing piece. You need something. You need help to make up the difference. Sweater vest. You go to your spiritual closet to get that peace that gives you calm and confidence and courage, boldness, whatever you want to call it, to take that step into the impossible, to do what humanly you could never do. But spiritually, you have been designed by God to receive from him in that moment to take that step. Rick Marshall, the most interesting American, that's his book. Now, this was in a radio interview or a podcast interview with him. So it's not in his book, but I still gave the book credit because I didn't know how else to do it. Roosevelt was the only president, he said, considered to be one of the greatest without a major war, depression, or crisis during his preg- pre- presidency. Was, I almost said pregnancy. I didn't. Uh, during his presidency. But he didn't have the great crisis, listen to this, guys, because he foresaw the coming storms and stared them down. Lincoln was the great emancipator, but Teddy Roosevelt was the great anticipator. You see, you don't have to enter crisis in the classic sense to deal with crisis. You can head off crisis by staring it down with your sweater vest on. I am not intimidated was the entire attitude of Teddy Roosevelt. Wait till you hear these upcoming sessions, guys. I mean, it's so profound. I will not be intimidated. And he stared down the crises. The crises fled before him. Amazing. So Teddy Roosevelt, question number six. I've been finishing each of the episodes with a question. Do you shrink and hide beneath the covers in times of opposition and difficulty? Or do you put on your sweater vest and step forth to greet the cameras with a confident smirk. Teddy Roosevelt, quote number six, and this is Teddy on stepping into the difficult moment. Teddy Roosevelt said this, you've got to perform without flinching whatever duty is assigned you, regardless of the difficulty or the danger attending it. If it is garrison duty, you must attend to it. If it is meeting fever, you must be willing. If it is the closest kind of fighting, anxious for it. What an incredible statement. Father, We need what is in that closet. Thank you for making a way for us to have access to it. But Lord Jesus, I pray that you would move us to reach out for it, to grab it, to take, Lord, what you have supplied for us so that we can live boldly in those difficult moments. We ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.